Okay. What was the name of some of the people that delivered milk for you? Pardon? Now, what were the name of some of your milkmen? And, and when did Claude you, Pearson. And when did you change from horse and buggy to... Um, I, I can tell you about that because Claude Pearson taught me how to drive that horse <laughs> before we started delivering with a truck. And the, the horse's name was Prince. <laughs> <laughs> so that had to be when I was about 15 or maybe 16. I was born in 26. So. Claude, uh, Claude Pearson. Anyway, the, the horse knew the route a whole lot better than I did. <laughs> we'd, we'd go down Springfield Avenue, I would fill up a carrier with milk bottles, and you always deliver to the back of the house. So I went behind the house, about three houses, and then I came back out to Springfield Avenue, Prince was there waiting for me. <laughs> he was the only one. That was one horse. No, I said he just had the one milkman, or did you? No, well, we, yeah, one milkman for the local Sykesville area, mm -hmm. and then we had a, another man who drove a box truck into Baltimore. That was Stem. No, Francis Stem. Francis Stem. Francis Stem. Oh. Oh, That's one of those men whose name was Francis Stem from up in Gateway. That's right. That's right. Francis Stem drove the truck into Baltimore. I think we both learned both routes, you know, the local route and the one in the bottom. Yes. I, I have some questions about the house. We've heard a lot about the farm and the right. mines, but what the about the house? house? It was huge. Were there um, people in the community who helped dem with the domestic duties? Yes. And the other part of the question is, do people remember the sale, the auction? And did Elder anybody does. get any... I have a planted closet from the mansion in my apartment, and I had a um, buffet, large buffet, which I offered to Terry when before I moved here, but they didn't tell me they wanted it until after I had sold it, <laughs> and it was too big to get into my apartment. But I thought it would have been lovely in the dining room or in one of the hallways because you could put things on it. Like they did with the uplands, with the uplands furniture and uplands land. It's a nice connection when you have yes. a piece of furniture or something like that. Uh, it introduces you to the history. Yes. We've heard a lot of that good history today. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful time. Do you remember a family that lived in the area named Berman? Yes. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Berman was the, the domestic, well, she helped with nursing duties for uh, Laura Basin. and his brother, uh, John Hart. Hartzell. 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 Well, it was Hartzell, but there was also... Yeah. Oh, well, you remember that. Sam Lewis and he had a brother John, but Sam was the one that took care of the horses uh, all the time. And uh, yeah, you'll find his picture there riding. And they lived in a little shack down there on the bottom near Springfield Roller Mills. There was another family that lived out in the back of the this, um, copper mines, the uh, Savoys, and one of the Savoy was. Well, he was working on the farm, and he did milking too. So um, I don't know. I can't remember. There was another family farm that did the milking. I can't remember his name. You forgive my. Uh, when well, he kept to be an engineer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Pardon? I have a question. Um, during the course of these meetings, we've learned a lot about the trains and how they pertain to 
Sykesville and Springfield. Did, did the train cars or did the dinky come up to this farm since it was so big? Them up? The dinky, dinky track. Did it have a connection no. with no. No. this farm? No, you know, the dinky just went from Much a spur out there and brought coal in to the Springfield Hospital. Okay, that was it. Yeah, we didn't have any. Did the farm ever use the, the train to get things to and from places? Pardon? Did the, did the farm ever use the train to get things like to Baltimore? Or did no, that was not the same thing. Yeah. You know, I know yeah. early on, we had a, we had a boiler there in the, in the you know, dairy plant, which when you pasteurize the milk at that time, we had a big tank and uh, hot water and pipes around the, which heated the milk. And then you had to have a boiler which produced the steam and we burned coal, and at one time, uh, the team, Sam Lewis, and we took a six-horse team with a flat wagon down and, and got coal off of the, one of the, the cars there on the siding beside the Sykesville um, I really went to Sykes. thing there, and then brought the coal back up. It was a process of, of pasteurization, which they, at that time, you, you heated the milk to 130, 144 degrees, precisely 144 degrees. That was recorded on a, on a chart. It held it there for 30 minutes, and that was the pasteurization process at that time. After I came home from the Army, I worked across the road at uh, the hospital as the milk pasteurizer there. So I didn't hear it that Well, I was in college, too. Well, Anyway, they use a flash, what they call a flash pasteurization now, but they heat it up to 160 degrees for 60 seconds or something like that, and then cool it right back down. But we had, there was a, in back of the pump, there was a big, what they call a pump house. There was a big well on that farm that supplied water enough for those hundred head of cattle, the calves, the horses, the hogs, and five families. And that was so. But then also, um, part of the process in the pasteurization needed the chlorinated water. And sometime before Dad came, there was a four inch pipeline built from the powerhouse at Springfield all the way over to the farm. And, um, and there was a tap off of that to supply chlorinated water into the dairy process. And then a couple times, uh, when they had problems with the pump, they had to put new uh, things in it, but they, they had to use entirely the uh, Springfield water. But uh, anyhow, there was a four-inch line that came across there from that powerhouse. And I understand that when they put that new road across and never dug up, nobody told anybody about a four-inch pipeline gushing water out of there, but anyhow. That was, that was, anyhow, there was a, we had a, up, up on the top of the hill near the Springfield Church, there was a double house residence, and then we had a big wooden tower with a wooden tank uh, for holding water, and the ground sloped so much that the, the ground level up there in that, uh, where the tank was, um, was uh, level with the second story of the big house. So, you know, we had to pump the water up, but then it could flow back down by gravity. Uh, this is what it did. But meaning that we had enough water to say for the, to feed all those animals. That was, and I, I guess they just closed the, when they dug, you know, did away with everything, they just uh, okay. closed it over. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, you had water to the second floor at the house then, right? Oh yes. And uh, how many rooms? Getting back to the house. How many? How many rooms were in that house? I, I really don't know. I was never up in the oh, second uh, story of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think there were that many rooms. They were large rooms, and, and uh, you know, nice. But um, it was a nice. It was a nice house. I think they, as they said, they had a nice house there in in the Baltimore. And, and early on, they had the one in Miami. But uh, and then Mr. Basement had a chauffeur. In the summertime, he would come out to. And right behind that pump house was this little small house that the chauffeur came out and lived there on the weekends. Uh, I don't think he didn't live there for full time, but he lived there on the weekends. And 
was known as, we had called it the chauffeur house, and um, Claude Diffenbaugh was the chauffeur. If anybody knew, knows anything about that. Anything? I can remember going in the house. The thing that impressed me was the great big bed with black and white tiles like you used to see years ago. And that, that mansion had a big head, had a big hedge all the way around it. Yeah. And one of the first jobs that I had in early Lawrence it was clipping that hedge. That hedge had to be trimmed Memorial Day, July the 4th, and Labor Day. And, and the grass all mowed. And one of the first jobs I had was, was um, clipping that hedge, and then all the grass had to be mowed with this push mower. And then the leaves raked up uh, in, in the fall. And I, I did enough work on the farm that when I turned 16, I was a full time. No, no, I was started earning a wage uh, uh, on the farm there, clipping hedges and, and uh, but before we started milking, but I was soon learned to start milking too. As I said, we, at that time you could get farm workers to work on the farm, but nobody wanted to milk cows by hand, so we learned how to cow milk cows by hand. And then the senior year in high school, I'm not bragging about it, but. Uh, I was in the barn at 4 o'clock in the morning and then helped deliver milk to Sykesville and then went to school. Yes, ma'am. I can't hear you. You'll have to speak up. Do you um, know the highest elevation in Sykesville? What was it? What's the highest, highest elevation, elevation in Sykesville? Highest elevation? Yes. I don't know. It might be 800. I've heard 800 feet, but I don't know. Yeah. The Presbyterian Church is the highest elevation. Yeah. It probably is. Yeah. I'm talking about the land that we're facing. You mean where the church is? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you said Ted and I have known each other for years. This day. Yes, my maiden name. There's a sidebar. I know half of your audience, being ladies, are dying to hear something about the house. Yes. And evidently not one soul here hardly got to go in. But when the Episcopal people took over a young man in the area who has made since made his living restoring and taking care of old houses. He decided to have a reception, and he got permission to invite everybody in this area to come to the house, and he had a petition. <laughs> he was trying to save yes. the uh, Jerry mansion. Trescott? Jerry Trescott. <clears throat> Lady Red Hair. <laughs> yes. And a, a number of people came, I think just because they wanted to see inside the house. <clears throat> and of course, his effort to save the mansion did not work, but anyway, there was a young man who was 17 or 18 years old who cared so much that he decided to hold this reception. He's since gone on to uh, well, Westminster and the area right down here. He did a couple of other houses, and um, he's now living in Tennessee, which is where he went to college to learn about uh, taking care of old houses. and. Um, He's still doing that as his life's work. I know. But it still doesn't help us know what it was like inside. <laughs> I, I remember when I went on the house tour, what, one of the things that impressed me was the dining table with the button underneath where the lady of the house would call the, the servant to come change the table, you know, serve the next course or whatever. And then the elevator. I don't remember that. The caged elevator, it was at, I guess it was near the steps, but it was an elevator. <clears throat> No longer live. Pardon? When did the when did the basements no longer live in the house? When did they move out? 
I don't think they ever moved out. Mr. Baseman died around 1960, and the, the dairy herd and machinery were sold. And Mrs. Laura lived on for a couple of years, but uh, I, I think she mainly lived in Baltimore after he died. She died in 70, 70? 70. She died. Viola yeah. Jeanette Ritter Basin. Yeah. They had no children. So I don't think they ever moved out. Was, there wasn't a time in the 50s when the house was vacant, is there? No, I don't think so. She you know, Mrs. Baseman had friends in the area, and, and they would have, you know, they'd come out for car parties and so forth there on the weekends on quite frequently, you know, when, when, they, when they were younger. She gave the fire department the pool table right after he died. Pardon? She gave the fire department the pool table and all the stuff out of it right after he died. And I mean, Miller Cooper and Cooper went up there and took it apart. Took it down and put it in the floor house. Yeah, I, I guess I can remember Mr. Baby being quite sick, you know, in the latter parts of the year. Obviously, going to college, but uh, um, that may have been influenced his labor seat to, to have, you know, retirement village at this time. Here, so I don't know. I'm sure it probably had some influence. about the Jones girls' pictures, and a while back, those pictures were really worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. People were collecting them. They even put out a small booklet with some of them in it. Yeah, the, the Jones sisters did a lot of work there. They were, yeah. you know, I don't know if they were famous or not, but they took an awful lot of pictures uh, throughout the community of different things, and, you know, and of course, they were black and white, and then they painted them uh, afterwards, and we're fortunate to have three or four there at the farming operation. I don't know, you know, they, they lived in a, a house there right across from the high school there on three Springfield sisters. Avenue. I don't know, there were, there were two of them, maybe three. 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 They always say they <coughs> took the pictures, one painted and one framed them, but I don't know if that's right or not. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened to all their pictures after they, uh, I don't know. Well, Jack Ruby had a lot of them. I understand, yeah. There's a good collection on at the Sykesville Gate House Museum. Yeah, Jack, Jack Ruby's a cousin. And, and I understand, I sometimes, some, I heard that before, that he had a lot of the, the negatives or something there. And Katie Springer's got a lot of them, too. Pardon? Katie Sandusky Springer's got a lot of them. I remember when uh, Fairhaven was just starting, nothing was built here, really. There were maybe a little tiny bit. And they were asking for secretaries. And I applied, and they said, oh, you're overqualified. <laughs> so I didn't get hired. <laughs> I one question here. We, when, Pardon? When we first moved up here, we lived uh, in the area John, because Sam is, was a teamster, and the horses didn't drag without Sam. Now, there, there were some others that did supply and so forth for individuals, but Sam was a te teamster. So I suspect that this, he was a heavy set man, I suspect the first one there, Sam, and my big brother John. But I, I Main Street, and we dug a couple of those up. 
So I guess they're still, uh, we, we gave them over to the museum. I think the museum's probably got a pretty good collection of them. So there's probably those jugs all over town, but they're underground right now. And uh, so there's a, there's a plug for archaeology, I guess. Um, by the way, incidentally, there was one that, that, that I found underground, another project, and I took it home and was trying to clean it up. And it just wouldn't clean up real well. And so I started turning the water a little hotter and a little hotter, and it cracked. So I don't know much about glass, but I don't know why I did that. But it, it, it must be cold before you uh, cracked the hot water. I know it was room temperature, but anyway, so um, so you can, I, just, I destroyed one of them too. So we, we, we saved some and we destroyed one. Um, right, right. Uh, I also just want you, know, this is a year kind of of celebrations in Sykesville. This is the 10th anniversary of the post office visitor center that's coming up. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but it's uh, November, I think, is the month. Uh, November 2002, I guess, is when we, we, uh, we opened up. And it's been a wonderful thing uh, for a lot of reasons. As you know, that post office serves a number of functions. It's not just a post office, but it's also a visitor center. It also houses the public restrooms down there, and uh, the ladies down there manage the rental of the second floor. Another thing they do, and in particular this is something that Kathy Gamble has, has been doing, is starting this, uh, I remember that, and I think it's been going on for three years. Three years. I, I lose track of time with that as well. And it's really been a lot of fun. I, I see a lot of uh, regulars that come, and I try and come whenever I can because it is so interesting. I learned an awful lot, uh, not only about Sykesville history, but uh, about a lot of other things. And uh, so it's been a lot of fun. But today, we wanted to thank Kathy for, for uh, so come on up here, Kathy. Aww. We wanted to thank her for, uh, and this is something that she kind of, uh, this was an idea that she came up with herself, and she's really taken the initiative. And uh, so thank you so much for, for, for doing that. And this is, uh, oh, so we are gratitude for that. <laughs> and, and, and also want to thank the other ladies at the post office who, of course, help in, in other ways. Um, what does it say? Kathy Gambrell, thanks for the walk in the past. <laughs> I feel I remember that. The town of Sykesville, 2012. Oh. I have to say that it's all of you that started that helped me start, I remember that, because you would come in the post office and we would talk about things and you would say, I remember that house being over there, or I remember when, and it gave me the idea to put this together. So we're in our third year, thanks to all of you. I guess we visited 27 places, plus or minus. So we've got more in store for next year. Sorry, I'm not used to that. More in store for next year. Let me know of any of your ideas, and I'll certainly Hello. try to get them on the schedule. Yes. Thank you, Matt. This is oh. Anyway, thank you, Gene. Nice. Yes. I just wanted to let everybody know how great it is to have a Sykes School post office. Yeah. 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 Well, as you know, this comes up from time to time. I think it, it, in tough budget times. Uh, I, I, I hope, I agree with all of you, I hope it sticks around for a long time. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, the elected officials are always having to make those hard decisions. So hopefully it will, we'll figure out a way of, of keeping it open. That's certainly my hope. And uh, anyway, thank you again. And hopefully we'll have many more years of, I hope so. oh, I remember that. Anyway, thanks.
1847. Some of these headstones age off. You're welcome, Ann. Thank you. Always. Get in touch. No, it's okay. <laughs>